And another myth that I've found, and that's this perception of irrigators as the helpless victims of these water wars. And in many cases, the ag community has a lot of political power. Hello and welcome to the Water Buffs podcast. I'm your host, Mitch Tobin, director of the Water Desk at the University of Colorado Boulder. I'm excited to be speaking today to journalist Heather Sackett. Heather is a CU Boulder alum and now reports for Aspen Journalism, a nonprofit news outlet that has done some great work on water issues. The Water Desk provides funding to Aspen Journalism to help support their water coverage, which in turn is republished through the Swift Communications chain of newspapers here in Colorado. A print journalist by trade, Heather has worked for the Adirondack Daily Enterprise, the Lake Placid News, the Littleton Independent, the Denver Post, and the Telluride Daily Planet. She is also the winner of the 2018 Center of the American West Thompson Award for Western Writing in the Memoir category. And she's the author of the Colorado Mountain Club, Bu Club Guidebook, The Best Crested Butte Hikes. Welcome to the show, Heather. It's great to have you join us. Thanks for having me, Mitch. Great. Well, let's uh, begin by talking about a really powerful journalism project that you recently worked on called Cash Flows. And this series examines how investors are banking on the West's water scarcity. Tell us a little bit about the series, what motivated the project and its main findings. So the series focuses on water investment in the West, and all three of these stories have a couple things in common. Um, the first is the transfer of water from agriculture to cities, so from rural areas to urban areas, um, and that's a trend that has been going on for years. Um, another common thing is how water is now treated as a commodity, and, um, and how some people think that the value of water should be left up to the market, um, and instead of water being treated as a public resource and a natural resource to be put to beneficial use, it is now also being seen as a money-making venture. Um, and so this project came about when um, a big part of my job is to go to water meetings all around the state. And um, in the course of that, I had heard whispers about this hedge fund called Water Asset Management that people said was buying land in the Grand Valley, um, which is this agricultural community just west of Grand Junction. And then um, I happened to sit next to another water reporter for KUNC, Luke Runyon, at one of those water meetings. And he, uh, you know, we got to talking and he said that he had been hearing similar things. And so we decided to team up and tackle this story together. Um, and so because this topic ended up being pretty controversial in the Grand Valley and people were just really reluctant to talk with us. And so we were not really getting anywhere when we were trying to call up people and get answers. And so we had to rely on data. Um, this story is pretty data heavy. Um, we had to go through all these property sale records and find all the purchases that water asset management had made since 2017. Um, and many of these purchases had multiple parcels of land, uh, which made for some very complicated Excel spreadsheets. Um, and then we mapped that data so we could have a visual representation of these purchases and really see the extent of WAM's ownership of land in the Grand Valley. Um, and so the main findings out of this story was that WAM has spent over 16 million on buying up 2,200 acres of farmland in the Grand Valley since 2017. And they are now the largest shareholder in the Grand Valley Water Users Association water delivery area. Hmm. Interesting. And how are their purchases being received there locally? Um, you know, local residents are uh, pretty skeptical about what WAM is doing. Uh, the Grand Valley is this rural agricultural community with a lot of generational family farms. And so just the simple fact that this is a hedge fund from New York City, um, that fact alone is kind of raises eyebrows. Um, 
we actually had trouble finding someone to talk to us who had sold to Wham um, at first. And some people that we talked to who would not go on the record said that they had sort of become these social outcasts. And this one guy said that everybody in town hates him now. And so, um, you know, and from some people, they're getting this feeling that they kind of sold out because they sold to a New York hedge fund. Hmm. Interesting. Well, the series also had a couple of other stories. Um, Daniel Rothberg of the Nevada Independent, Brett Jaspers of KJZZ in Phoenix also contributed. What were uh, some of the things that they uncovered in their reporting? Um, so in central Arizona, the, the rapidly growing Phoenix exurbs are looking for new sources of water from the Colorado River. And so there's this town called Queen Creek, um, whose population has increased over 60% since 2010. And they are looking to transfer water from farmland to these new residential developments. Um, and the interesting part is that the farmland is owned by an investment company and they could stand to make 20 million from this deal. And so it's another example of um, the transfer of water from rural agriculture to cities. And so some people in these rural farm communities that already use some of this Colorado River water think it's a slippery slope and, and think that when water leaves a community, it usually ends up being bad for that community. Um, and then in northern Nevada, uh, Water Asset Management, which is the same company that's operating in the Grand Valley, um, they own this farm called Winnemucca Farms, and they want to capture 300 acre feet or no, I'm sorry, 300,000 acre feet of flood water um, and store it in this underground aquifer and sort of wait for cities or whoever might want to use that water to come calling. Um, and then they could make money on that. And so um, this would be another potential example of um, water being transferred out of its place of origin. And so once again, people are skeptical of this plan that could potentially transfer water away from rural agricultural communities to urban areas. Great. Thank you. That's a great uh, overview of the series and would encourage everybody to check it out. It really seems to be an important trend uh, happening in the West with water being transferred from agricultural to uh, more urban municipal uses. So I'd like to take a step back before we talk about some of the other stories that you and Aspen Journalism have worked on and just talk a little bit about uh, covering Western water issues and what you find rewarding about that, what you find difficult and challenging. Tell us a little bit about what it's like to cover these issues um, that are very often very complex, contentious, and not the easiest to explain. Sure. Um, so Aspen Journalism, we are um, a local news organization. So we cover primarily stuff in the Roaring Fork Valley, um, which is the watershed from Aspen down to Glenwood Springs. Um, but we also do stuff throughout the Colorado River Basin in Western Colorado. Um, and so a big challenge is kind of trying to connect the really zoomed in local stories to the big picture of what's happening on the big river. Um, and so, and another challenge is trying to distill this very complicated subject, which has a long history, uh, lots of jargon, lots of technical terms, lots of acronyms um, down into an audience of regular people. And so um, I'm always trying to think about like, why would this story matter to the average reader and um, just trying to connect the dots. And I think also there's, there's not many stories that I do that are truly new. Um, you know, like I said, this transfer of water from ag to municipal uses has been going on for a long time. And so it's sometimes it can be challenging to figure out, um, you know, how far back in history do I have to go to explain this to people so that they can understand, um, you know, with every story could essentially start with back in 1922 when the Colorado River Compact was signed. But, um, you know, sometimes you don't need to give the reader the entire backstory. You just need a little bit of context so they can understand the issue. Um, so that's probably some of the challenges I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, something I like about water journalism is that it's really a, a little bit of everything. It's not, you know, I wouldn't say it's just water. Water is really comprised of like science and uh, local government and state government and law and the environment and agriculture and politics. And so from 
you know, I come from a newspaper background where I'm just a generalist and I would cover every topic. And so I still kind of like that water is a little bit like that. I get to learn about, um, you know, all different kinds of topics and every story that I cover. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And likewise, I've, I feel the same way that it's just uh, such a multifaceted issue and there's so many different angles and so many different connections that it's hard to get bored with it. Um, there's always a new story to be told. So, and you know, as you, as a journalist, are trying to explain these issues to the public, um, do you come across uh, misconceptions, myths that the public and your audience has that you need to grapple with when it comes to water issues? Um, yeah, for sure. I would say there's very few issues that are black and white. Um, but I think that the way water has been covered in the past, um, it, it, that's the way it can seem. Um, but I think one myth is that urban growth always leads to more water use. And um, I don't know if you've read the book, Waters for Fighting Over by John Fleck, but that he sort of debunks that myth. And um, there's actually been a, this decoupling of growth in the American Southwest and water use. So Western cities have actually become super efficient water users in recent years. And so urban growth doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean more water use. Um, so that, I don't know, it's a pretty interesting concept that I think is counterintuitive to a lot of people. Um, and another myth that I've found that um, it's pretty pervasive to the point that it's almost like a cliche at this point, and that's this perception of irrigators, like farmers and ranchers, as the helpless victims of these water wars who are kind of like at the mercy of these cities with unquenchable thirst. And, um, and I see, or I think you see a lot of journalists frame the story this way. Um, but in Colorado, and specifically Western Colorado, um, agriculture is who owns almost all the water. And so agriculture is not actually a victim. And in many cases, the ag community has a lot of political power. And especially in the state legislature, they are the ones who are influencing water policy. And so, you know, it's not to say that those who make a living from agriculture don't have challenges, um, you know, related to like climate change and commodities markets and small profit margins and stuff like that. But when it comes to water, um, the ag community is actually playing a very big role in setting the agenda and influencing the conversation and influencing the policy at a state and local level. And so it's just one of those issues. It's much more complicated than a straightforward portrayal of bad guys and good guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are a lot of complexities and nuances and, and gray areas. And, you know, as you mentioned, the uh, reduction in per capita water use in a lot of cities has definitely been a success story, um, yeah, which is not to say that there's not more uh, that could be done in terms of conservation. But, um, you know, also to your other point about the importance of agriculture, it's true in other states as well, not just here in Colorado, where agriculture really controls the lion's share of, of water in, in, many Western sh in many Western states, especially the Colorado River Basin. So... Um, I'd like to talk about one story that you at Aspirin Journalism have been covering, and that's a proposed dam and reservoir project that would uh, supply water to uh, growing urban areas here on the Colorado Front Range. And uh, this is uh, a proposal that would export water from Homestake Creek, and it would be uh, used here in the Front Range of Colorado where most of the state's population lives. So tell us a little bit about what's being proposed and where things stand with that. Sure. Um, so I, I don't know how much your audience knows about um, sort of like the plumbing of the Colorado River system, but um, a, an important thing to understand is that um, water, so for water in Colorado, um, it's a challenge because most of the people live on the front range, but most of the water originates on the western slope. And so there's this whole plumbing system um, in what's called uh, Trans Mountain Diversion. This is Water Words, a fast explanation of a bit of water lingo. I'm Hannah Lee Myers. Today's water word is Trans Mountain Diversion. According to Water Education Colorado, Trans Mountain Diversions, sometimes called Trans Basin Diversions, divert water by drawing it from one stream or river 
into the watershed of another. So imagine a system of tunnels, ditches, pumps, dams, and reservoirs that are part of a system that moves water from one river basin into another river basin for use. These transmountain diversions are central to the water systems of some Western states. In Colorado, nearly 90% of the population lives on the Front Range, but around 80% of the water originates on the Western Slope in different river basins. So perhaps one of the best known examples of a Trans Mountain Diversion is the Colorado Big Thompson Project that moves water through the Continental Divide from the upper Colorado River Basin on the west side of the divide to the Front Range and the Plains on the east side. So if you hear someone reference a Trans Mountain or Trans Basin Diversion and you imagine infrastructure and engineering that carries water from basin to basin, You've got it right. You're correctly imagining a Trans Mountain or Trans Basin Diversion. Now back to the Water Buffs podcast. So for example, something like 40% of the headwaters of the Roaring Fork River are diverted to the Front Range. Um, and so in this case with Homestake, uh, the cities of Aurora and Colorado Springs have a proposal to build another reservoir in the Homestake Valley, um, which is near the town of Red Cliff, and it's in the Eagle River watershed. Um, and so this new reservoir, which would, it's being called Whitney Reservoir, um, it would allow the cities to take more water to the Front Range. And so there are several iterations of this project and it hasn't been decided which one they're gonna try to um, get permitted yet, but it could store up to 20,000 acre feet of water. And so where it stands right now is the project needs a permit from the Forest Service to do a geophysical study and drilling for test holes, basically to see if the site they've chosen for a dam and reservoir is going to work. And so the Forest Service has um, received upwards of 500 comments during the public comment process um, most of which were against granting this permit. And so um, the mayors of Minturn and Redcliffe and then um, State Senator Kerry Donovan and different environmental groups, they're all opposed to this drilling permit. So um, I guess, you know, that this is going to be um, a story that we're going to cover for years years if you know if this reservoir is ever to be built it's going to be a very long process and so um so where we are right now is um they're trying to get that drilling permit mm -hmm. yeah and it's interesting we mentioned before that um per capita water use in a lot of western cities has been declining and there have been gains made in conservation but at the same time there are these new projects being proposed here in colorado elsewhere in the basin uh that would create new reservoirs expand reservoirs um, and just sort of points to the pressures, uh, some of them on the system. So um, another story that you've been writing about is uh, a concept known as demand management. So it would be great if you could explain to folks um, what that means and, and how that program works. And essentially it's uh, trying to, uh, on a voluntary and uh, compensated basis and a temporary basis, um, have reductions in agricultural water use. Um, you've been writing a couple stories about that. So tell us a little bit about de uh, demand management and how that works. Right. Um, so a demand management program would essentially pay water users to reduce their consumption and leave that water in the river to send downstream to Lake Powell, where there's this pool set aside, um, which is basically an insurance program to defend against um, what's known as a compact call, which is what would happen if the upper basin states, which is um, Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, and New Mexico, if they were not able to deliver the 75 million acre feet of water over 10 years to the lower basin states. And this is all laid out in the Colorado River Compact from 1922. So we get on our time machine, go back to 1922. Um, and so Colorado water managers, managers uh, desperately want to avoid this scenario, um, which looms larger every year with the increasing effects of drought and climate change um, because it could trigger mandatory cutbacks for water users in the upper basin. And so everybody wants to avoid that. 
Um, and agriculture is a key to this program um, because that's where most of the consumptive use is. That's where most of the water is. And so um, it would essentially be paying irrigators under a temporary voluntary program to not irrigate and leave that water in the river. Um, and so over the last year, um, the state has had uh, eight different work groups of water managers and water experts explore this concept about whether a program like this could work in Colorado. And so after the first year of, um, you know, their meeting throughout the whole year, and they just released this 200 page report, which details the findings of all these working groups and um, some of the lingering questions that they have. And that document is now open for public comment through the end of the month. And you can find it on the Colorado Water Conservation Board website um, if you want to read it and comment on it. And so there has not been a decision made about whether this program is something Colorado should do or not. Um, and it looks like the work groups will probably continue to do this feasibility investigation for another year, um, although that decision is up to the CWCB um, and they haven't really decided yet. But so the first year of investigation into whether Colorado should do it or not has just been completed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the idea of paying farmers um, you know, not to use their water, that sounds good you know, in the sense that they're being paid, but are there reservations in the agricultural community about how this would work and um, concerns about it? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, you know, what people are saying about it is really kind of mixed. Um, I think, you know, some people in agriculture are kind of skeptical that a program like this could ever be fair. Um, and there was a whole work group dedicated to the subject of equity. And so people are talking about how could you make sure that with a program like this, certain basins or certain geographic areas wouldn't be negatively impacted. And also, um, conversely, that they wouldn't somehow end up reaping more rewards than another area. So there is a real concern about equity of impact, but also equity of opportunity. Um, but I think most people involved in this discussion, <clears throat> discussion um, recognize the real threat posed by climate change and the dwindling levels in Lake Powell and the um, threat of a compact call. And so I think people recognize that it's time to take some kind of action. Uh, there is a sense of urgency in some of these discussions, but I think whether specifically a demand management program is the best course of action for Colorado is still um, something that's kind of up in the air. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. It's an example of an attempt to make things a little more flexible um, than they would otherwise be in terms of how water is used and, and moved around. You've also written about another program that involves uh, transferring water from agricultural uses to municipal uses. It's known as the Alternative Transfer Method, or ATM. Uh, tell us a little bit about how that program works and what you've been writing about. Um, so, uh, so a little bit of history here. Um, so last year, the city of Aspen, after this lengthy water court process, was denied the ability to build reservoirs in Castle and Maroon Valleys. And so um, the city of Aspen takes its water directly from Maroon and Castle Creeks, and they don't have much storage to speak of, no big reservoirs. And so for city officials, they say this is a problem, that they don't have this storage. Um, and so... Uh, you know, whether the city actually needs that storage or not is debatable. There have actually been studies on both sides of the issue. But um, anyway, so the city is now looking for other ways to increase the light reliability of its water supply. Um, and since most water rights are held by irrigators, they naturally turn to agriculture. Um, and so ATMs are seen as a way to reallocate water more fairly and sustainably from agriculture to municipalities instead of permanent agreements, um, which are often called, you hear them referred to as buy and dry. Um, and so ATMs are a, a voluntary temporary way for agriculture to loan water to cities. And the Colorado Water Plan actually sets a goal of 50,000 acre feet of water transfers through these ATM programs by 2030. Um, but in the Aspen area, it's a bit more tricky because um, so the easiest way to make a project like this work is with um, by using agriculture above the city's diversions. 
and um, but there's just not very much irrigated agriculture in the upper Roaring Fork Valley. You know, if you've ever been to Aspen, you know, it's, it's very mountainous. It's the high alpine. There's not much growing crops happening in the upper Roaring Fork Valley. So um, the story that I did was kind of about how Aspen is going to have to think outside the box to make a project like this work in that area. Mm hmm. And one of your freelancers, uh, David Williams, did an interesting piece earlier this year about a study that was done on cloud seeding, which is essentially a form of weather modification, try to get it to snow more um, in certain areas. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, so there's a study that was published last, last winter, actually by some researchers from CU Boulder um, and some other universities that found that cloud seeding does in fact, increase snowfall. Um, and so cloud seeding is where there's these like generators on the ground and they send silver iodide particles into clouds, which forms ice crystals and then that falls as snow. And cloud seeding has been something that ski resorts have been spending money on for years. And so have other entities like the Colorado River District, um, but it had always been hard to prove statistically that it actually worked. And so researchers tracked this, the cloud seeding plumes until it fell as actual snow they could measure. Um, and so this study was important because it shows that um, you know, weather modification can be used to create more snowpack. And if you create more snowpack, then you create more water. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And I guess you also have to contend with the fact that people um, further down the line may not get the snow that they were expecting if uh, the clouds are, uh, uh, you know, causing the clouds to precipitate uh, in a certain area. It does have downstream effects, so to speak. Right, right. Yeah, it is, it's complicated because you never know exactly where that snow is going to fall. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of, um, you know, water journalists have been uh, sidetracked to cover things related to the virus and to the economic meltdown, to the protests that we've been seeing. Um, I'm wondering, you know, how you think um, this very chaotic time in terms of the pandemic and the economy and uh, protest, how that's affecting water issues um, here in Colorado? Hmm, it's a good question. Um, you know, I think for a lot of, um, well, I don't want to speak for everyone, but I just talked to a, a rancher the other day who said that it hasn't really affected his day-to-day -day operations. You know, he jokes that he was already social distancing anyway. Uh, he just kind of has been going about his business. Um, I know that some, well, there was that story a couple weeks ago about how the wastewater treatment plants are now testing sewage for the virus. Um, so you can apparently detect outbreaks before people show symptoms. So that kind of has a water angle. Um, I know for a while back during the spring runoff season, which is like um, really popular for rafting companies, some, some of those were only allowing trips to go out with people in the same same household. So it was really, you know, kind of limiting their business because you couldn't just put groups of people together on the same trips. Um, and I know that the economic crisis has affected somewhat how the Colorado Water Conservation Board has been able to fund their grant programs. Um, they've kind of, they're kind of uh, messing around with their schedule a little bit until they see what kind of funding they can get from the state. Um, but, you know, other than that, I, I'm not, I, I know, uh, uh, the meeting schedule. So like I said, a big part of my job is to go to all these meetings all around the state. There's so many entities um, on the state and local level that have monthly or every other month or quarterly meetings and so and conferences. And so all that stuff is now um, moved online. And so I think, you know, in a way, it's good because it streamlines stuff and then, you know, everybody can attend. You don't have to worry about driving in, in a snowstorm or something like that. But um, you know, it, it's also from a reporting perspective, it's also not as good because I can't have those conversations with people in the hallway and kind of try to figure out what's really happening outside the meeting. So that's definitely been a drawback for me. Um, so those are the main effects that I'm seeing. I'm sure there's a million other little ripple effects from the pandemic that I'm not even aware of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned about covering meetings and how you know, to some extent you can cover them if it's online being uh, live streamed, but 
you know, as you mentioned, uh, as a reporter, a lot of what you're doing at these meetings is talking to people on the sidelines afterwards, follow up questions, making connections, and obviously very hard to do that uh, just from a computer screen. Yeah, for sure. Well, uh, we've talked about some of the stories that you've um, worked on, as well as um, some of the freelance stories uh, that have appeared in Aspen Journalism. Uh, what are some of the stories and issues that you have your eye on in the months ahead? Um, so a lot of these that I mentioned, you know, demand management, the home stake story, um, those are going to be ongoing for years. And so, um, you know, like that's kind of what I was talking about with all these stories have so much history. And so those are definitely things that we're going to keep reporting on. Um, a, another story, I'm not sure when this interview is going to air and whether my story will be published by then, but um, I'm currently working on a story in um, about measuring devices in division six. So last, and division six is like Northwest Colorado. It's the Yampa white and green rivers, um, also the North Platte river basin. And um, so about a year ago, the division engineer issued a requirement that all water users had to install measuring devices um, so they could keep track of how much water they're taking. And so measuring devices are the norm in other river basins. But this is really new to Division 6, which is pretty rural, and they've always traditionally had, you know, more than enough water to go around. Um, but in 2018, when they had that drought, they had a call on the Yampa for the first time ever. And so I think that um, also just highlighted how important it is to have these measuring devices um, when you have to administer the river. And so um, now that it's been a year, I'm just checking in to see kind of how that process is going and... Um, you know, how people are feeling about installing these measuring devices and how um, enforcement of that policy is going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. And I think a lot of people are surprised to learn that uh, the amount of water use isn't always measured. Um, so it'll be an interesting issue uh, in the months ahead. Right, yes, for sure. Great, well, anything else that you wanna add, Heather? Um, one thing I did want to say, so I think a lot of this, um, you know, the transfer of, oh, we've talked a lot about the transfer of water from ag to municipal. And I think um, one thing that people always talk about with regard to this is, is there's this like cautionary tale you hear water managers talk about all the time. Um, they just say the words Crowley County. And that's this area in Eastern Colorado that used to be this thriving hub of agriculture until um, about the late 60s and 70s when they started selling their water rights to Colorado Springs, Aurora and Pueblo. And um, when there was no longer farming, the population of this area declined and Main Street kind of became hollowed out and there were a lot of vacant storefronts and now Crowley County is known for its prisons, um, which is what provides jobs and supports the economy there. And so um, Crowley County is kind of held up as this worst example of what can happen with buy and dry and what happens when an agricultural community is separated from its water. And so um, if you want some more background, uh, Marianne Goodland did a piece for the Colorado Independent back in 2015 um, that you can find online. But I think that sort of fear is what is underpinning a lot of um, what you hear from people when they're talking about uh, what WAM's doing in the Grand Valley or um, a demand management program. Uh, so this is just, you know, another example of like this historical example and how it's influencing how people think about water now. Yeah, and as you mentioned, it's um, it's not just agriculture. If you remove water from a farming community, the ramifications are are pretty broad. It affects Main Street. It affects the people who sell tractors and seeds and restaurants and all of these other uh, businesses. So it can really have a huge impact on a rural community. Right. Yes. Absolutely. Great. Well, uh, thank you so much for taking time to chat with us. We are really excited about our partnership and. Looking forward to seeing more of your stories. Yeah, this is great. Thanks a lot, Mitch. Thanks, Heather.
Thanks for tuning in to the Water Buffs podcast, available in audio and video formats on most major media platforms. Water Buffs is a production of The Water Desk, an independent journalism initiative based at the University of Colorado Boulder's Center for Environmental Journalism. You can learn more about us and about water issues at waterdesk.org. We're also on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. If you have a comment or have a question, please feel free to email us at waterdesk at colorado.edu. Special thanks to the executive producer and co-manager, Hannah Lee Myers, and to our graphic designer and co-developer, Jeff McGee. Be sure to check out our other episodes. And until next time, thanks for tuning in.